Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our third uh, seminar for the Sinochisis Digital Classics um, Culture Heritage uh, Series. And today we're going to talk about 3D imaging and uh, 3D printing. Uh, this class is the first of two that we will have about 3D technologies. So I just wanted to say um, a couple of words about um, uh, this, uh, let's say, this subgroup of, uh, of lessons that we will have. And we will talk about 3D imaging and printing in this one, and we will cover uh, 3D modeling and texturing in the next one. But uh, what we will try to stress in this class and in the other ones is that, um, of course, there are no very, very clear um, boundaries between these technologies. And even if uh, there are, uh, they become much more interesting and really display their fuller potential when they're used in combination. So we will probably uh, talk about them together and in combination more than uh, one opposed to, to the other. Um, the way we will structure this uh, class today will, uh, will be um, a bit of a back and forth between me and, um, and Gabriel Bodar. And we will start um, talking about uh, the various um, kind of 3D technologies that are, are more of interest for digital culture heritage. It's not you know, uh, an extensive, it's not a full list of all the existing 3D technologies, but these are those that are at the moment quite relevant in culture heritage, and these are those that we are going to discuss. And I will uh, then talk a little bit more about 3D imaging in particular. I will give um, let's say some uh i will make some points about uh, why we think it is interesting it is appropriate uh, to use 3d imaging technologies when dealing with cultural heritage and with the ancient one in particular and we will give um let's say a quick overview of the various um, options from a technological perspective that there are uh, out there and then i'll uh, hand it over to gabby they will do pretty much the same for 3D printing. And we will conclude with um, a tutorial for the 3D imaging technology that we have chosen for uh, our exercise, that is photogrammetry. But we'll talk uh, more about that later. Now, um, I give uh, the, the stage to, uh, to Gabby to introduce the 3D technologies that we're going to cover. Um, for this summer. Great, thanks, thanks, Valeria. Um, yeah, um, I, I basically want to, I mean, just take a couple of minutes before we start the main content of this to, to define some terms um, more than um, more than anything. So, if um, you give me just a second to share my screen, um, I will. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to very briefly talk about these five um, 3D methods that, that we're going to um, talk about. And I want to say a little bit about how um, they differ from one another and what we, um, what we mean by them. In particular, the, the first two um, terms, um, it's not, not everybody uses them in the same way, but this is, this is a fairly uh, well understood and I think useful um, way to distinguish between two different uses of 3D technology. So um, 3D imaging, if we start, is, um, is effectively, it's, it's scanning, it's photography, it's, um, you know, uh, X-ray, um, 3D um, modeling, such as CT scanning, um, of an existing object, um, which you, you would capture and reconstruct, perhaps um, in its incomplete state, um, as in this example, as in its damaged state, where its, its, its current state is what is of interest to you. So you're creating a model of something that exists as it exists, um, whether it be something historical or, um, or something uh, uh, complete. Um, contrast to this, the second term, 3D modeling, um, which, um, which we use in the sense of reconstruction or visualization of um, a 3D artifact of some kind, such as a building, which may or may not be complete in its current, um, in its current uh, state. 
So this is particularly useful when we have the archaeological remains of a building which may be very little more than the foundations and a couple of fallen columns or, or so forth, which we reconstruct in, in much the same way that an archaeological illustrator might create a, a two-dimensional reconstruction on paper. Um, of, of such a thing. And a 3D model in this sense is, um, is not quite the same as 3D imaging. It's, 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 it's starting from the opposite. And so in effect, 3D, 3D modeling is what, um, is what architects do when they're designing a building. So in the same way, they're, they're creating a model of a building that doesn't exist yet. In the way that as archaeologists, we, are, we may be creating a model of a building that no longer exists. Um, couple of other terms just to give um, some definitions then. Um, so virtual reality um, is the technology whereby you create an immersive view of, um, of a 3D model of some kind, such as um, can be viewed by wearing these 3D goggles, as you see in this, in this image, the 3D uh, headset, which um, projects on a screen in front of each eye, a very slightly different image to give the illusion of, three of uh, perspective and three-dimensionality, um, that you can then, using gyroscopes in the, in the headset, um, you can then walk around this 3D space just by moving your, your head and moving your body um, in, um, in the, you know, relative to the, um, to, to the earth. And that, um, that gives you this sort of immersion of the inside of a building, and you can, you know, you can move around um, you know, a 3D model or or, or a 3D um, scan of um, that, that's been uh, that's been put in into virtual reality um, uh, equally. Um, contrast to this augmented reality, which is um, most typically um, you would use through a phone or a tablet or something similar, where you would point your camera at an artifact of some kind or at a view of some kind and the software would give you some overlay over that view in on your screen so normally you would point the camera you would see on the screen exactly what the camera sees um, but in this case the augmented reality is you add something over it so this could be um, pointing your camera at uh, an archaeological ruin and the um, the augmented reality is the um, the the reconstructed version as you see in this in this example um, or you could have augmented reality in a museum setting for example where you point your camera at an exhibit and the augmented reality is a pop-up of some text or some other interactive component that tells you more about that exhibit um, or the most um, you know commonly used augmented reality in in games um, uh, most famously, um, there's the haunted house game where you 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 point your you know you move around the inside of your own home with your phone camera on, and it superimposes ghosts and other monsters in your house to make it um, that that much more creepy than if you were playing a game that was set in some anonymous setting. Um, so those those are all examples of, of augmented reality and, and how we might use those in a in a heritage um, environment. And finally, 3D printing. This is um, using a 3D model, um, either that has been captured using 3D imaging or that has been created using 3D um, building and design um, of some kind, and making that into a physical object again. Almost certainly, you would lose some of the information in that um, original 3D model, but you're creating, therefore, a physical model um, from this, and you're printing. And we'll talk more about printing um, at the end and some of the problems um, with that and some of the techniques used in that. So that's just a quick overview of, of the terms um, that we'll use in this and, and that um, will be used in the other 3D class um, later this semester to give you um, a, a bit of a handle on what, what we mean when we use these terms. As I say, imaging and modeling in particular, that distinction um, isn't universally used with those um, with that terminology in, in all the literature you'll come across, but that, that's what we mean by the distinction between those two things. Okay. Thanks, I'll hand back to Valeria. Thank you, Gabby. Um, I will now uh, take you through um, some more um, specific um, conversations about uh, 3D imaging in particular. And let me find my, uh, my slides. Uh, and uh, we will start um, our, um, our discussion on 3D imaging with what I think is... Um, so let me share my screen first. Um, and then I'll get back to you. Okay. And 
let me put my slides in present mode. Okay, can you see my slides? Yep. Okay, so um, I'd like to start with uh, this question that you will hear me asking over and over again uh, during this seminar series, which is why. And I think that it's very important that we always reflect on why we are using digital methods and digital tools and uh, that we don't do that just because uh, you know they they seem interesting that because we are curious about the new technology and you know of course it's uh, there's nothing wrong about being curious about something new or being curious about you know something that looks appealing and um, uh, a little bit shiny but we shouldn't forget that uh, to make these things uh, really meaningful to make them uh, really uh, to have them really making a difference in our research, we really need to back up our adoption of digital tools and methods with something more substantial with a research question or um, with the fact that they enable us to do something uh, better uh, than we used to do before or something that was absolutely impossible to do before. So why should we do uh, 3D imaging? Why should we bother you know, learning and uh, downloading the software and so on? Well, there are some things that 3D imaging uh, allows us to do and uh, especially in digital culture heritage is becoming more and more prominent. And I'm just going to give you um, a very few examples, just uh, let's say as uh, starters for uh, more conversations maybe. Uh, there are surely many more things that you can do, but these are, I mean, those that seemed more, uh, more interesting to me. So the first, uh, possibly most obvious application of 3D imaging when we look at ancient artifacts is that through their digital facsimile of something, we can achieve an enhanced view. So we can, for example, zoom in, uh, we can look more closely, we can you know, examine more clearly uh, cracks and damage. If we're trying to decipher things like graffiti or epigraphy, we may be able, through this uh, digital artificial enhancement of you know, the, the, the image of the artifact, to see things that we wouldn't be able to see with the naked eye. So we would actually be able to produce new knowledge through this process that you know, wasn't there before, just because the technology was, um, wasn't there before. Um, another quite important uh, application of uh, 3D imaging, especially in uh, museums and in all the uh, public facing um, products that employ uh, 3D technologies, is manipulation and affordance. Is the um, is enabling uh, expert and non-expert audience to somehow interact with the artifact without endangering the artifact itself, without even touching the artifact. So this image, for example, is taken from a very popular exhibition that was on display at the British Museum. It was called Ancient Lives. And some of uh, some Egyptian mummies were um, were imaged through CD scanning, we'll see later what that is, uh, so that people could see what was inside them uh, without even opening the sarcophagus that was left intact. And not only this was great from a preservation point of view because it didn't produce any damage on, uh, on the original artifact, but was also very, very um, engaging for the audience because they could actually um, uh, virtually um, rotate and touch and sometimes even slice the mummies that were uh, on display. Uh, another big thing that um, I really I really like about 3D technologies, but we could say that about many other digital technologies, is that they allow, um, uh, let's say, multiple variants. Um, when we uh, when we look at traditional scholarship, sometimes it becomes more difficult to express um, that there are various hypotheses that are equally or if not exactly on the same level, but they are all to an extent uh, valid and um, and uh, worth of attention. 
with, with 3D imaging, we can, for example, you know, if we want to make a hypothesis on the original um, color of an ancient statue as it was in the classic color exhibition, we can 3D print a replica and, and paint um, uh, and paint uh, the hypothetical restoration that we want to suggest, but we don't have to limit ourselves to only one. We can have, you know, many digital replicas of that ancient statue, and they are all colored in different ways, showing that possible that the different variants are um, are possible and are all relevant to be to be recorded and looked at. Uh, another application that is becoming increasingly popular among archaeologists is, um, uh, is using 3D technologies, 3D imaging technologies to record things. And for archaeologists in particular, this becomes uh, relevant when they are working in a trench, when they're working on an excavation. And one very uh, straightforward application of it is to record the excavation itself. And because while excavating, sadly, uh, you know, the site itself gets destroyed, that's what happens, uh, that's what's uh, inherent to the archaeological uh, process, the, the excavation process itself. But it's becoming more and more uh, popular to use 3D technologies to record the excavation, which means that in the future, those excavations that won't be, you know, won't exist anymore because uh, you know, the things have been taken out and the thing has been closed and so on, could potentially be revisited uh, on, a, on a computer screen or even through a virtual reality as uh, the research group in Lund, for example, is experimenting with. And this 3D image of, um, uh, of the archaeological site, of course, can be also uh, connected to external documents like databases or information about um, about the various findings that um, that were brought to light during the excavation process. But when I said recording, of course, uh, we meant that in a more general sense, not just excavations, but 3D imaging is great for recording things that are there, are out there, that exist in the physical world. And if we think, for example, also of how important sometimes it is to record artifacts that are in danger, or uh, you know, we are uh, we are traveling and we are archaeologists or classicists, and we see you know a wonderful collection of epigraphies, and we really wish we could take them home with us, but we can't, but we can at least 3D image them and maybe examine them uh, later on in our, in our own office, on our uh, computer screen. And some of these technologies, and we will see that, are actually very quick, very cheap and very easy to learn, which also makes them uh, basically now an indispensable skill uh, in, the, in the kit of uh, an archaeologist or uh, a classicist. Um, another uh, another point that I wanted to make about 3D imaging, especially when it is used in combination with 3D modeling or other 3D technologies, as we were saying at the beginning, uh, is that it allows contextualization. Because when we look at a single artifact that is already, of course, rich in information, it has a lot of um, historical, archaeological, artistic uh, information per se, but it becomes uh, even more interesting when we can actually put it into context. And having a digital uh, 3D replica uh, of uh, that object really allows us to uh, simulate its uh, original position, simulate its relationship with other artifacts, or simulate the uh, relationship with the built environment, for example, like in the example of the tomb of Amphipolis that we can see in this, um, uh, in this example here. So these were, as I said, just a few reasons why it is interesting to learn a little bit more about 3D imaging. And uh, I would be very happy if, you know, at the end of the seminar, we, we, um, we could, you know, find together uh, some more applications of it. But now let's get a little bit more practical and let's talk about the various kinds of uh, technologies that we can use to perform digital imaging, because there are you know, various kinds of 3D imaging and they have all pros and cons. So I want to uh, walk you through um, a very brief overview that again is not exhaustive, but can be um, a first starting point to approach 
um, the offer about 3D imaging uh, technologies and software. Uh, before we start, I just wanted uh, again to make a little clarification about terminology and I wanted to show you um, the difference because this thing uh, would probably come up uh, in our conversation again uh, between a point cloud and a 3D mesh. So when we talk about a point cloud, uh, as you see here on the left, the bunny on the left, it is a 3D shape that is made of a number of points, as, as, it, as the name said, it's a cloud. It's, you know, um, it's an agglomeration of points that all together uh, shape um, a 3D uh, object, in this case, uh, our, our little bunny. On the right, we have a 3D mesh, and you see that the surface of this 3D object is quite different because it is actually made of tiny triangles, so it's it's not points, but it's little. It's the areas of these little triangles that are connecting to each other that do form the the three D um, the three D object. And about the three D mesh and the triangles that are called polygons, uh, the more you have, the more detailed is your three uh, D object. But now. Let's look at the various kind of 3D imaging technologies. So one very popular, uh, especially for archaeology, is laser scanning, um, and especially the time of flight laser scanning. I'm not going to go into uh, how they work from a technological point of view, because we have a very rich class. We're going to talk about a lot of things. So if you are interested in knowing more about the technicalities um, of the technological aspect of it, um, feel free to look at you know previous classes we had on 3D imaging or just Google this, um, uh, these technologies. You will find a lot of information. But just in a comparative perspective. So laser scanning um, is great uh, if you are imaging um, uh, especially large uh, portion of space. So you could image um, um, easily an entire building or even an entire block. Um, and it has quite, quite good uh, geometric accuracy. The problem with laser scanning is that even though prices are getting um, you know, much more and more affordable. Um, it is still quite expensive, so it's still a kind of equipment that only a big, um, a big project can afford. It's not something that the single researcher or the small research group can really, um, um, you know, can really use. It also produces uh, quite big. Um, digital output and it becomes you know a little bit complicated to have enough space to store it and enough power to process uh, that amount of data so it's not just the equipment per se but it also requires quite good processor um, to, to complement uh, the, uh, the, the entire process um, and although it's it's great on large areas um, it is uh, quite understandably not as good on smaller artifacts is not uh, precise and accurate enough when we uh, zoom uh, into a smaller scale. If we are interested in imaging, you know, with um, laser scanning technologies, uh, something smaller, we are probably better off using other technologies like the triangulation one, and uh, that allows portable scanners that are way cheaper. They're getting actually quite affordable now. Uh, that are def definitely works better on uh, smaller surfaces. Uh, they are, you know, much more portable, and they often come with quite easy to use software packages that allow you mostly to just, you know, plug and play it. Um, another um, another uh, 3D imaging technique uh, is called structural light and it's about projecting um, a pattern of light on an object and then uh, basically recording the distortions of that pattern of light uh, will produce um, a, 3D, a 3D shape, a 3D object. Uh, structural light is quite easy to use and it's quite uh, cheap and um, it actually reaches a very um, satisfactory level of accuracy. 
Um, let's say the drawbacks of, um, of structured light is that it really requires a very, very precise calibration of light. So it has to be performed in a studio in quite controlled environment. And that is not always possible. For example, it's not uh, possible in, uh, in open air. Is, is, it has fallen a little bit out of fashion, uh, but I mean, it's, it's still a possibility, it's still there. Um, something that is also becoming increasingly popular, although it's very expensive, is CT scan and CT stands for computed tomography. And this is a technology, is the one that we mentioned before about the Ancient Lives exhibition that was originally developed in the medical industry. Um, and uh, basically produces uh, slices of X-ray vision that gets overlaid until they build um, the 3D shape. And uh, it is definitely not portable. Most of the time, it's uh, actually the artifact that has to be taken to the uh, to the CD scan. It requires quite a lot of training, but you have seen the results. I mean, it's quite amazing. It's not invasive at all, and it allows uh, these uh, quite interesting things like virtual autopsy of, um, uh, of you know, uh, um, biological remains, but also, you know, to look inside objects without breaking them down, basically. Uh, another technology that is the one that we're going to uh, actually use for our exercise is photogrammetry. Uh, photogrammetry is based on triangulation. That is the same uh, thing that we have seen before about the portable scanner. It's very, very cheap. You can perform quite good uh, photogrammetry with any consumer camera, even with your mobile phone, that actually some of them have pretty cool uh, embedded cameras. It's very easy to learn. You will see in our tutorial, it takes 10, 15 minutes to learn all you need to know to perform a good photogrammetry. Then it's just really up to you to practice a little bit uh, to, to become good at it. It's very portable. You just need basically your phone or your camera. You can do the processing later on on your computer and it gets um, a 3D mesh um, as an output. Um, we have chosen to use photogrammetry for our exercise because considering you know all um, characteristics of the various approaches it seemed really the best fit for you know all these reasons we have just listed before. I mean it's really cheap, it's really easy to learn and the software as well uh, is um, is re it's very easy to it's very easy to use and is free to an extent. Uh, so the software that we're using for the exercise we're suggesting to use for the exercise is called Edgesoft PhotoScan. You can request um, a trial um, for free, uh, so you can complete the exercise without spending anything. If you like the software, the software is actually not for free, but it has an educational license that is very affordable. I think so, I think it is around uh, $50, uh, but we're still looking for good uh, options for completely free photogrammetry. If you use a PC and not a Mac, you may want to give a go to 3DF Zephyr that um, could, be, could be an option. If you have a Mac, I'm afraid you're stuck with uh, Agisoft PhotoScan if you want to use uh, photogrammetry. Um, part of um, our, our exercise will be, um, uh, will be actually yeah, producing, um, producing a 3D image of uh, an, uh, a physical object true photograph. So we will take a number of pictures of this object from different angles, and then we will process these pictures in one of the softwares that we just mentioned. And what we will get will be a quite good, a surprisingly good and easy to uh, produce uh, 3D replica, 3D image of that object. Um, a very close cousin of photogrammetry is structure from motion uh, that is also quite cheap and um, relatively simple to use, but let me stress that relatively, because uh, the installation in particular of the software, uh, software like Visual SFM, does require a little bit of IT skill. It's not that straightforward. It's not just double click and uh, install. Um, um, it has, you know, it, it, it is 
as performance uh, relatively similar to photogrammetry, but the output in this in this case would be uh, a point cloud, which is sometimes better, sometimes uh, worse, but depending from uh, what you are interested in. Uh, I also want to mention this other technology, which is not properly, uh, not strictly talking uh, a 3D technology, but it is an imaging uh, uh, technology that is very useful, especially for epigraphists and numismatists, and it's called uh, reflectance transformation imaging, uh, abbreviated as RTI. And what it does, it basically uh, produces um, a replica of the object that also simulates different uh, lighting of the object so that you can uh, basically uh, simulate that movement that you do when you're trying to read something better and you move it under the light until you catch the right light to see what you were trying to see. Uh, so basically what you do, uh, you take uh, again a lot of pictures uh, but this time instead of having the camera moving around the object as we will do with photogrammetry uh, you have the camera that is fixed and is actually the light that is moving uh, around the object and these different um, light conditions we will then collated and browse together in a viewer that is actually um, it is actually free so if you produce your rti you can then use uh, this, um, this free viewer that was developed by the University of uh, Southampton. And I think that that was my uh, last slide on uh, 3D imaging. And I am stopping. Uh, I don't know if uh, Gabby wants to add anything about that. Um, uh, not immediately. Um. Okay, then then we can maybe move on to 3D printing. Yeah, so um, so in terms of talking about, um, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna start by asking uh, as Valeria did the question why, uh, why would we why would we use 3D printing? Um, and this is this has been quite a um, a, uh, a a discussion, um, and there's. There's various reasons why you might choose to, to 3D print something. Um, and I'm just gonna throw out a couple of ideas and I'd quite like if actually anyone else in the conversation um, joined in. So if you, rather than sharing me um, with the thing, if you would let let, let Google decide who's um, who's being seen at any point. So if either Valeria or Anisa, the other people who are in the in the Hangout wanted to um, wanted to add any comments, please, um, please do. Um, so the um, the first um, and most obvious reason to 3D print something is to create a, a copy of an object that you can handle. So if I've um, there's a uh, a lekythos in the Ashmolean Museum that you can, with permission, get access to and, and go and you know take very detailed photographs of and so forth. But you can't take it home with you. You can't hand it around um, to your students. Um, you can't you know. Um, drink something out of it. Um, but if you create a 3D model of it um, and then print out that 3D model, you have a copy. It doesn't look anything like the original because it's the wrong color. It doesn't weigh the same as the original because it's um, it's made of a, a light plastic um, rather than um, rather than the, the ceramic. Um, and in this case, it's not it's not hollow because I, I printed this as a solid, solid object. Um, but nevertheless, it has some physicality. So um, you can't say you, you know, you holding this shows you what it's like to hold a lekythos and to pour oil out of it or whatever you might do. But it's it gives you some sense of the physicality of the object. You get some sense of the scale, um, although this one wasn't printed to the exact right scale. But if you printed it to the right scale, it, um, it would and so forth. So you, you get a and some sense of that. You can hand this around a classroom. It doesn't matter if this breaks because this, although it took about four hours to print, um, it only cost, um, I think I calculated about 80 pence in, um, you know, so about a dollar or a euro or so to, um, uh, in, in filament and electricity to, to print this. So it's not, you know, it doesn't matter if, you know, if someone accidentally breaks it, drops it on the floor or whatever. Actually, this is slightly fragile. I could break the top off right now if I wanted to prove that point, but I don't particularly. Um, and likewise, um, you can use it for um, uh, trying trying to you know 
do experiments as to what you think these things might have been used for if you're not quite sure and what they're, what they're for. So um, in the collection of the Institute of Classical Studies library here, we have um, a collection uh, donated by, um, by Ehrenberg. Um, we have a, a, a small kylix, which is exactly this size. This is a, this is a, um, a life-size um, reconstruction of it. And um, you can see this is just printed again from some from some photogrammetry. Um, you can see this is very small. This is smaller than a kylix normally would be. A kylix is a drinking cup you would normally, you know, hold by the handles and, and drink drink wine out of. Um, you, you wouldn't get very much wine out of this. So so you know you might think to yourself, well, what, what is this small one for? Um, uh, you know, is it for drinking hard liquor out of rather than wine? Is it for, um, you know, maybe for mixing, you know, perfume or, or something? It's just made to look like a kylix in a novelty sort of way. Um, is it a ritual object, maybe a votive um, or something? These, these are all questions we can ask anyway, but we could actually, you know, we, we could say, you know, what would it actually be like to drink out of a kylix this small? Um, um, not, not particularly useful um, is, is, the, is the answer. Um, so, you know, you can create physical objects to, to play with um, in, in various ways, you know, and I've, I've just got a sample of, of various things here. Um, so these can be handling copies, they can be teaching material. Um, you can, um, you know, you can give access to them to people who are not close enough to a museum to, um, to go in and, and handle their, their, um, their, you know, their handling copies in the museums um, or, 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 you know, give access to them to, um, uh, to people who wouldn't be allowed to handle them because they're very fragile and so forth. Um, you can also use them for experimental reconstructions. If you have fragmentary objects, as um, as Valeria was saying, you can reconstruct um, the object in various different ways, print out those various different reconstructions and see how feasible um, they, they seem, how useful they are at that point. You know, would they stand up if they'd been reconstructed the way you'd, you'd designed? Would they be comfortable to drink out of if you reconstructed them that way? Um, the the some sense of the of the sensory experience you get from um from a um from holding a physical object so again um you know we've seen lots of pictures of um, of, of lekithor we know what they're for um we you know we can imagine them in use we can even handle them in um, in museums but to actually get a sense of what it's like to use them if you actually were to get one of these and you were to print it hollow unlike this one um and Use it to serve your olive oil, you know, um, at, um, at at lunchtime, and, and actually get a sense of of what these objects are like. You get some some sensory experience. Obviously, this, as I said, it's the wrong color, it's the wrong weight, it's the wrong texture. Um, it doesn't. It's not as cold as ceramic would be. Uh, but you you could print in other materials, but but that would then get more expensive. Um, so so there you know there, there's there's a limit to how useful that is, but but nevertheless, it could potentially be useful. And again, um, in ways that. Um, that the the fragility of the original object wouldn't wouldn't allow. Um, I'm thinking in particular of um, uh, Diana Burton told me um, last year that one of the things she um, she had students do with 3D printed um, uh, drinking drinking vessels, um, the, the the full size ones, um, is they would have the objects in in class and then they would go out to the to the park or out to the um, to the gardens university and they'd play kotobos, the the thing where you flick drinks at at um, at each other or at a target. There's no way you could do that with the original you know ceramic one um, from from the museum, um, but with a 3D printed one, you know you can you can make as much mess as you like. You run running around in the park with you know students getting overexcited throwing throwing drinks at each other some of them are going to get dropped and smashed and whatever but it doesn't matter because they're they're cheap and they're easy to to make new ones um so there's all sorts of um advantages to um to that and as, as i say please do jump in if anyone has any um any examples to add or or any any criticisms to make i mean the 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 this in particular has been the and uh, the slightly controversial thing where people um, you know, people have objected that you know the difference between this object and the original object is too large to make to make it useful for them to to handle that. Um, the The last thing I wanted to last example I wanted to um, suggest was um, using the process of designing um, and and then of producing a um, a three d printed object. Um, can be used in the process of thinking about, of learning about, imagining, and teaching um, the creation process of, of creating something. So it's not quite the same, obviously, it's not at all the same as um, creating a, uh, a ceramic 
um, piece of pottery with with clay and um, with the various methods that um, that are used for that um, and you know it might actually be quite useful to have um, you know students studying ancient pottery to actually go to a clay workshop and make themselves some pots and, and fire them in a kiln and all that sort of thing but but nevertheless you can think about some of the process um, of especially of designing um, and decorating these these objects, you know, because we could we could give this to um, to somebody who would who would then you know paint it and decorate it in the in the you know how how a you know a lekathos would have looked, or or in a different way, um, in a more creative um, rather than rather than uh, just reconstruction. Um, and again, um, Diana Burton um, gave me a good example of this, where um, as will be described in a forthcoming article, um, she um, she had her students. In um, in a myth class, um, she had them um, design, um, you know, in in either on paper or on or on um, on a on computer um, imaging software, um, painting software, um, uh, a design to go on a Greek Greek vase, um, which would um, which would go over both sides of it. Um, which had some relation to Greek mythology, but also had some direct connection to uh, to themselves, and got some um, uh, really really interesting um, results from that. The most the most striking one for me was um, was a student who had some connection to Samoa, I think, um, had um, created a vase with on on one side um, something related to to their their home. Um, island and on the other side the image of Poseidon the Earthshaker um, and you know when asked what was the what was the relevance of this to to um, to themselves um, said this you know there was a recent um, earthquake and tsunami um, had struck their island and so you know this this re reference to um, Poseidon Earthshaker from Greek mythology was was really relevant to them in that in that sense and that can get you to thinking um, you know maybe in a slightly more um, indirect way about um, all the questions of what the images on a, on a Greek vase meant to to the ancient audience, to what they meant to the person who commissioned it, what they meant to the artist who painted it, what they meant to the people who were using them at a dinner party or in whatever other context um, pots, um, pots were used in, um, in the ancient world. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's going to be a really useful process for, for, for students and for um, and for scholars to think about how, um, you know, how we go about deciding what we what how what we put on an emit one pot, what shape we make a pot, um, all all that sort of thing. It's um, you know, it's it's not so much a sensory experience, but it is part of the the you know intellectual and imaginative experience of of creating objects. Um, the the other example, which sorry, Valeria, go ahead. No, I have a lot of. A, a lot of little things that I would like to add, but I'm waiting for you to. Uh, I'm waiting for you to finish, and then I will add a couple. I was. The only thing I was going to say was I was going to ask you to maybe talk about the art of making as a, in the context uh, of that. Yes, I will do that uh, very happily as well. I just wanted to say yes, I loved all the all the examples you made. Uh, they all made me think of uh, of something more and. I like the idea of you know using the replicas to uh, to show the scale because one thing that I've noticed on myself you know uh, is that you see pictures of things and very often you have no idea of what is you know the average scale they have while you know having access to a one-to-one -one, uh, replica can you know help you in that respect as well as you know from a more experimental archaeology kind of side you could for example yeah. No, and even if you do know the the scale, I mean, if you if you if you see an image of this and it says you know five centimeters um, yeah. on the on the side of it, that's not quite the same as holding one in your hand and knowing. Yeah. No, it's a different it. it's a different yeah. experience, and I remember uh, also you know studying in in anthropology things like okay why things for a certain use have a certain shape, which is a knowledge that was clear at the time. And, you know, it is clear for us now, you know, why, I don't know, why a pen has, you know, that shape and why, you know, it has, you know, a place to hold the cap and everything. But maybe, you know, in 1,000 here, people that will find an object, it, it won't be as clear as it is 
as it is not clear for us, for many objects, why they have exactly that shape. And I think that handling them, handling replicas and playing with replicas does help you understanding the reason of the design. So what is the connection between the design and the use? And even though we lose a lot of information, of course, from the materiality, and it would be you know, crazy to deny that, there is so much information that we retain that it's, you know, I believe it's still, it's still absolutely uh, relevant. And one, another couple of points that I wanted to make is that we could use 3D printing and 3D printed artifact to show what is invisible for teaching. Like, for example, I have this model of, you know, uh, a female body part that was used uh, for teaching sex education and community centers is not specifically classics related, but this is, I think, a very cute application of 3D printing technologies showing, you know, what is invisible, what you couldn't see uh, otherwise. And of course, I mean, there are models and anyone could, uh, I mean, there were already models, but if you don't have access to the models or if for some cultural, political, economical reasons, these models are not available. The opportunity to make your own, I think, is really empowering, especially you know, when we're talking about sex education. Um, and on top of you know, all, the, all the things that you mentioned, I would also like to briefly mention accessibility. 3D printing can enhance accessibility, especially for the um, uh, you know, uh, high impaired, uh, sight impaired, um, users and visitors of, of museums, for example. But it's also great for public engagement. And not just because it's, uh, you know, it's a novelty, it's fun, but because what you were saying, you know, especially in combination with 3D imaging and 3D modeling, it allows people to manipulate, to change, to reinterpret and to make real, to make, you know, to make material, to make visible their, their process. And um, about the art of making, this is um, a project that um, our colleague and friend Will Wooten is uh, uh, leads at King's College and he's collaborating. He couldn't join us today, but he's collaborating uh, with us, uh, introducing a little bit of 3D imaging and 3D printing um, in, the, in the syllabus. And we, um, we were quite fascinated by uh, the possible um, uh, interchanges that can be between, you know, learning about ancient craft, the ancient ways in which things were made, pottery and mosaics and sculptures, and the craft, the material craft that goes into, and you'll talk about that uh, just, just now, that goes into producing a 3D printed artifact as well as in producing uh, a 3D model or a 3D scan. Because, I mean, there is a knowledge that goes into that. It is practical, it's technical, it's know-how, it is, uh, it's craftsmanship. And what does this digital um, know-how that is required to make a replica can tell us about the know-how of, you know, making the original artifact and, you know, what are the possible relationships with, between them? Yeah, great. Um, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I, I also have a, a hidden um, <laughs> body part that you don't normally see. Um, if, if you know that could be used again for educational purposes, yeah. um, that um, that I didn't uh, I didn't get out. But um, yeah, no, I think I'm particularly interested in how three um, D three D models can be used as. Um, you know, the, the handling of 3D models can be used um, as an aid in particular for people, as you say, who are visually impaired. Um, it's important that we don't, we don't think of this as a replacement for, um, for handling original objects or for other ways of interacting with, um, with original objects, but as a, as a supplement to them, um, it, um, it could certainly be, um, be very useful. It's certainly, you know, more useful to hold a 3D object than a, you know, a braille representation of a 2D photograph of an object, which um, you know, you, you you get so much more out of out of this equally as we get so much more out of handling this um, than we would from looking at a two D object, a two D representation of an object. But um, um, 
Yeah, so maybe um, maybe I should move on and talk yes. um, talk very quickly about um, uh, some some tips when you're producing a um, a three D um, print. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, then I will screen share again my browser window, and I will project that. You seeing my slide there in full? Yes. Great. Thanks. Um, so um, the first thing to bear in mind when we're talking about um, 3D preparing an object for 3D printing is that 3D printing is, is an additive manufacturing process, which means that, or, or at least the kind of 3D printing we're talking about um, is, is an additive um, process, which means that you start with nothing and the 3D printer adds layers of um, of plastic or filament um, to um, to something a layer at a time, and the reason this is relevant is, as this um, diagram illustrates, whatever you print um, has to have something below it. So, if the current layer is the same size as or smaller than the layer below, you're golden. But if you attempt to print um, a um, you know a, a a triangle with the point down um, and the 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 wider surface at the top um, an upside down pyramid for example um, you're going to have um, difficulty with the bits that overhang the layers below and so we have to think and I'll talk about that in a minute about the um, the mechanisms for for how we we can support um, those those overhangs um, in the printing process so the first um, the first step. Um, in um, in printing, of course, is to acquire your three D model. Um, the, you um, you can either acquire a three D model by downloading an existing three D model from uh, some somewhere like Sketchfab or one of the other many other websites that will enable you to download or purchase three um, D models um, ready for printing. Um, and the first thing you will do, um, or, or 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 you you can create your own with photogrammetry, as as um, as you will be doing today. Um, but the first thing you will do is when you have your object, which will look something like this. You have a three D model, for the outcome of a photogrammetry, which will look something um, like this, except it'll be it'll be in three D, not just a two D photograph um, as here. Um, is you will discard all the color information because the three D printer, of course, will print it in a in a, in a monochrome filament. Um, and um, so you end up with something, something much simplified um, like this. This is also a very low resolution model. You can you can almost see um, the polygons on the surface of this if you look closely. Um, but um, but even if you've acquired this model um, that someone else has pre-prepared for three D three D printing, um, you will want to uh, edit this in a three D imaging um, tool um, beforehand to to check that it is. And that it has the the, the qualities you want. Um, so you know you, you you can decide on the scale and that you're printing it. You can decide um, to uh, flatten one of the surfaces um, and so forth. But the most important thing to do is to um, and many 3D tools and I'm, I'm showing Mesh Mixer here as an example. Um, and it has a, a tool called Inspector. Um, is this tool will look for any imperfections in the surface of the model. Um, a, a 3D model, in order to print it, has to be watertight. Um, if you can imagine, it has to not have any gaps in its surface anywhere. So those gaps need to be filled. They can just be painted over, or you can manually um, decide how you want them to look. So on this 3D model, um, because I scanned this, um, this uh, small kylix um, on a surface of some paper, we had to cut the paper away on the under on the underside. We didn't have any information about the underside of this cup, so I um, I, I created a fake um, sense of what the underside might look like um, just using the three D software, um, and then I made sure the whole thing was um, was watertight. So so you know you you have to edit the the object first to make it um, to make it watertight. The next thing you do is you you, you then um, open your object. In the software that's so, in this case, I'm using a different piece of software that's tied to our printer. This is the Craftware software because we use a Craftbot printer. Um, you can also do this this preparation in in something like Mesh Mixer, but but it, it's useful if you have the software that's specific to your printer because a lot of the settings will be um, preset. And in this software, once you already have a a, a watertight um, uh, object and with a with a flat surface, so you can lay it um, against the um, 
the, the, the bed of the printer, um, is you can then position it, you can rotate it, you can resize it. Um, the 3D model may or may not come with dimensions um, in, the, um, in the information, so you want to, to make sure that this, so in this case, I set this um, so that it was sized to, to exactly 11 centimeters from, from one end of the handle to the, to the opposite handle, because that's how big the, um, the object in the Ehrenberg collection was. Um, and you, you, know, you, you, you decide how it's going to be printed um, in that. Um, context. You then, and this is what we were talking about with the overhanging objects, those, um, those handles that, um, that stick out at either side of the cup um, need to be supported. So what you will actually do is you will create supports using the software to hold those handles up. And then after printing, you will cut those supports off. Um, because they, they're, they're not part of the model. And so it, it will print them specifically slightly lighter and with a very, very slight and sort of weak spot at the top of each support. So it's easy to snap them off and cut them off. Um, but nevertheless, you will, you will have to start off with those supports um, in, in place. Um, and then you select things like the quality that you want this print to, um, to be, how fast you want it to print, um, what you know, a few other mechanisms such as whether you give it a raft underneath the print which helps the the object to stay stuck to the base or whether you want some other um some other strategy your the software will help you with a lot of these things but it's that they're all things to look at and and think about and this is also where you um you decide on the temperature um that um that you want to print at and and things like that again that will mostly be decided for you by the uh, by the software based on what sort of material you're using but but the, these are all things which have to be embedded in the um the file that is sent to the printer um, a, a note um here when we're talking about temperature and so forth about filaments um there are all sorts of different materials that you can use to print with of course um mostly plastics but you can also print in metals you can print in concrete um, there are people who print in chocolate um there's you know almost anything you can imagine can can be um, printed and you can print in in artificial wood um for, for a certain context but the two most common filament materials um for uh, the kind of 3D printers we'll be talking about, um, you know, domestic or, or small scale um, educational 3D printers um, are ABS, um, which is a plastic. It's quite durable. It's waterproof. You can use it for objects that are going to be kept outside. If you want to print, you know, garden furniture or something like that, um, you can use them to create um, plates and cups, things that you will eat from, you will, you will wash up. Um, so it is, it is quite durable. It's waterproof. Um, this has a very high print temperature. Um, and um, and because it's plastic, it's of course um, highly polluting on the atmosphere. If you you know if you if you throw some away, um, you know in ten thousand years time, it'll still be sat there on the seabed, you know, being um, being eaten by fish or whatever. Um, in um, the the alternative, which is um, the material that uh, that we like to use, is PLA, um, which is uh, to some degree biodegradable. Um, you, it's not just that you could you could throw um, throw the, the the 3D printed pot um, onto your compost heap when you're when you're done with it, um, but nevertheless it it, it will degrade um, relatively harmlessly into the environment over time. Um, as a result, it's not as durable as ABS. You you shouldn't use PLA to make um, you know, crockery or cutlery that you're going to eat with. And um, you shouldn't use it to make something that you're going to leave outdoors because it will degrade um, in, in moisture and changes of temperature. Um, it has much lower print temperature, so it's easier, easier to, to print um, and cheaper to print because you're not using as much electricity to heat up the filaments. Um, and, uh, and on the whole, I, I, I think it's a much preferable um, object to use. It also doesn't stink quite so much when you're printing with it. If you can imagine melting plastic in order to print with it, that gives you a pretty bad smell. Polylactic acid doesn't have that um, stinking plastic smell. Um, so those, that's, that's, that's another choice you have to make when you're preparing your 3D model. Um, and then you print the model. Um, and there's various things you need to keep in mind when you're printing something, including um, making sure that the, the bed at the base of your printer is, is level, making sure that the bed is clean um, and so forth. Um, but um, essentially, eventually you will print, and there is my, um, is my little um, miniature Kylix um, just printed on an Ultimaker printer. Um, not the printer that we use here in the ICS, but another one that we have in this building um, with the, uh, the supports in place. And so after we, we, um, we, finished printing this and took a couple of photographs of it. Um, I then, you know, took a pair of pliers and snipped off 
those supports and then I, I you know sanded down the underside of the of the handles to make them um, to make them slightly smoother and and, uh, and and so forth. So that's that's the process end to end, if you like, of producing a um, a three D uh, a three D model. Um, and I guess if you if you if you try this out, the, the the thing the thing to note is you know as a as a trial and error um, thing, you will you will start off when you first print things. You will start off um, with maybe. 75% of your prints going wrong in one way or another. Um, and once you become pretty good at it, you will find that maybe only 10% of your prints go wrong in one way or another. So, you know, it, it's, it's a learning, it's a learning curve, but when you first try it out, there will be, um, there will be further, further things that you, you can get. Um, and if you're, if you're watching this video as part of, um, the, uh, the program here, at the Institute of Classical Studies, um, then Valeria may in fact be um, be offering you a trip to the 3D printer um, if you produce something interesting and and you'll get to try this out for yourself. And those of you in the rest of the world, approach approach your local, um, uh, whichever department in your university you think is most likely to have a 3D printer if you if you want to try one of these out. Um, I'll hand back to Valeria now as she wants to to show you how to do how to do photogrammetry to to produce your 3D model in the first place. Okay, um, thank you, Gabby. Yes, I confirm that uh, the students in London, if you're interested uh, in seeing how the 3D printer works, if you want to bring uh, one of your uh, models and you want to try out, uh, you know, to, to see how it looks uh, printed, feel free to, to get in touch. We will arrange something. Um, so what I'm going to do now is giving you a very brief tutorial on um, how to perform uh, photogrammetry, how to produce uh, a 3D um, image of an artifact or of an object just using uh, pictures. And uh, I promise that it's, it's, you know, it, it was very easy to, to learn and very quick to teach. So now I, I, must, uh, I must show that to you uh, to prove that uh, I was not lying. Um, so the thing um, about photogrammetry um, is that um, to produce a good 3D model, a good 3D image, you don't need um, a great camera. You just need to know how to take uh, the pictures correctly. And there are a few tips that you should bear in mind, and probably your first attempts won't be that good. But after you know a few. Um, attempts, um, it, it, gets, it gets much easier. And I'm not going to show any slides now. I'm just going to uh, use some props to show you how things work. Uh, but you will find those tips summarized in the slides if you want to, um, if you want to have a look at it. So uh, our helper for today is going to be this little friend here this replica of uh, an architectural detail. Um, so what, what do we do when we, uh, when we perform photogrammetry? Basically, is taking a lot of pictures around the object. So when you choose your target, when you choose the object that you want to image, be sure that you have um, access to um, to the object all around it, 360 degrees. If that is not possible, sometimes it's not possible, try to you know, make up for the uh, blind spots as much as you can, or be aware that those uh, areas that you know, were not reachable by the pictures won't be obviously in the, uh, in the final 3D model. So the point of photogrammetry is, as I said, taking pictures all around the object. And uh, a couple of uh, tips about how to take those pictures when you are imaging an object is basically to, um, and this is you know, rule number one, your target stays still. You don't move the target ever. If there is you know, one part of the object that, you know, if you're trying to image the object like this and you take pictures and then you think that you can turn the object and take pictures of the other side and then join them together, no. It doesn't work. The object stays still, doesn't have to move. If you accidentally move your target while taking the pictures, you have to start again, I'm afraid. So when you have an object, you just go around like, you know, in a virtual circle all around it. 
if you're trying to image, uh, let's say, a wall that is in front of you, you take uh, pictures that are, uh, let's say, in a straight line perpendicular to your target, and you move along the wall. Um, something, something more about how to take the pictures. So there are various approaches to this. I'm just going to talk about the one that I use, and I think that works better. Um, so let's say as a as a general rule to get um, a, you know a good a satisfactory photogrammetry you should think that each point on the surface of the object that you want to image should be in at least two pictures so how to ensure that you can find your own method and you can experiment on you know whatever uh, works best for you personally what I do is I you know uh, virtually divide the object into zones and then I can focus systematically on each one first and so I, I am more um, more confident that I have thoroughly covered the object so for example if I'm trying to image something like this I may start you know just with the lower part and you know taking pictures one after the other uh, click 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 only of the over, of the of the bottom part and be sure be try to make sure that the subsequent picture has an overlap with the previous one of at least let's say 30 40 percent that helps having you know each point in a list of images um, and then you can move to let's say a middle part and you again go all around and take pictures with the 30 40 percent overlap also don't forget that the overlap should also be you know, on the vertical axis, not just on the horizontal axis. When you have uh, taken pictures of all um, your object, all the um, uh, all the parts of the object that you know are reachable, you will find that probably there are some bits that were harder to reach than others. Some bits that are a little bit you know occluded. For example, you know, looking at this object, let's say all the part underneath the nose or you know uh, the the palm of the hand they are a little bit difficult to reach so you probably need you know to change angle a few times to be sure that you are also including in your photogrammetry those you know slightly occluded uh, areas um, if you read some photogrammetry manuals and i strongly uh, advise you to if you are into that there there are some good ones that are uh, free online, they will mostly advise you to try not to use uh, the zoom of your camera. To be honest with you, I do use the zoom. I like it and I think that it works uh, it works fine and it really helps catching some uh, you know some smaller some smaller areas. But in general, if you can try to keep the same distance that is you know actually more consistent and it helps, uh, having a better um, a better final result, but don't be afraid of you know using the zoom for some uh, some specific details. Presumably, you should you should try to use optical zoom rather than digital zoom if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is okay. This is mostly what you need to know uh, about how to take the pictures. Let me say a little bit something about. Uh, objects that are not really suitable for photogrammetry. So you shouldn't, uh, let's say, waste your time attempting to do photogrammetry of those objects uh, because you can achieve better results with those maybe uh, using other technologies. Um, so one of the limits of um, photogrammetry is that um, it needs surfaces that are uh, a little bit diverse, that, you know, where the different parts can be Ha enough recognizable. So, for example, uh, a wall that has no features is just a white wall, or it has, you know, a repetitive pattern wallpaper would be very difficult to 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 create a photogrammetry hall because there are not enough, um, let's say, differences um, in the in the surface that can help the photogrammetry software to identify the different areas of the object that you are trying. To, to image and you know even something for example like this object 
that is monochrome and some features are really, you know, there are some features, you could have some results, but this is not, uh, let's say, one of the best objects that uh, would give one of the best results, you know, with photogrammetry, because it's not, uh, the features are not, do not stand out uh, enough. Another thing, uh, photogrammetry doesn't, um, doesn't work with transparent objects because, well, of course, because the, the light goes through. Uh, um, and it doesn't work very well with reflecting um, surfaces, again, because um, the light bounces back and the pictures um, are, not, you know, are not suitable for photogrammetry. Um, another thing that doesn't really work well with photogrammetry are very um, hairy or crisscross surfaces or very, very complex surfaces, like, for example, if you were trying to image, you know, a box of snakes, photogrammetry is probably not the best, um, not the best technology for you because it would be very difficult, almost impossible to reach all the different angles, all the occluded areas. Also, you know, uh, surfaces like, you know, human hair or animal fur, or you know, a soft toys with with a fur or a plant, the leaves of a um, of a tree, they tend to move. And as we said, if your target moves, uh, then the photogrammetry is um, is compromised. You have to uh, you have to start again. Um, some other tips: um, try uh, to avoid uh, projected shadows on the object, uh, including your own. Uh, if you are taking uh, the pictures going all around, this happens a lot, especially in open air, try not to project your own shadow on the, uh, on the object. To an extent, um, the software that we're using, Agisoft, is able to distinguish between what you're interested in and what is noise. So, for example, if a person you know, passes by while you're taking your pictures, don't worry because the software uh, we'll understand that that thing is accidental and we'll exclude it from the 3D model. Also, there is always a little bit of you know, noise, a little bit of bits that you're not interested in in your model, and then you just you know, clean that out uh, in, a, in a 3D editing software like Mesh Mixer that Gabby mentioned, or uh, Mesh Lab, or uh, your 3D editing software uh, of choice. Uh, one more thing about um, objects that are a little bit featureless. Uh, there is something that we can do to, uh, let's say, help the photogrammetry software performing a little bit better, and is adding uh, things that will make uh, you know the pictures different from each other. For example, as we saw in the example that Gabby showed, we can put our object on a, on, a, on a newspaper, for example. So the things printed on a newspaper will help the photographs looks, uh, look different from each other. So even if the object is repetitive, the, uh, you know, the, the, the paper underneath or the other things that we put underneath are different enough so that the, the, the software algorithm can work out the shape of the object. Or you can add, you know, little things like post-its of different colors, or you know, uh, colorful dyes, or things like that, just to differentiate uh, the different uh, areas of the um, of the surface of the object that you're interested in. Um, okay, I think these were now you're ready, you know, all the basics uh, of photogrammetry, and you're ready to start experimenting with it. Um, all the objects are a little bit uh, complicated. Very dark objects are a little bit complicated. Um, I don't know if Gabby wants to add any um, any other tip for uh, for photogrammetry. Okay, um, and I just want to finish this class. Um, uh, sorry, I'm I'm I'm, I'm reading um, the questions from. Um, uh, Anisa, <laughs> that's that's uh, that's a very uh, uh, a very philosophical way to uh, Anisa is asking <clears throat> about uh, the the algorithm uh, perceiving the gestalt uh, of uh, uh, of the object. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid, yeah, we are we're, we're not we're not there yet. Um, uh, but also going back to um, another question that Anisa asked uh, in the chat. Um, 
uh, about um, training the students to um, to perform photogrammetry and doing it uh, in museums. Um, and if uh, you know museums are interested in having their artifacts as 3D uh, models that people can see and sometimes download and manipulate and maybe 3D print, uh, my answer is yes, I think so. Not all museums, but I think it's growing uh, because uh, it is um, it's great for public engagement, it's great for the visibility of museums, especially smaller museums are, you know, are starting uh, making their collections digital and available. Uh, the Sketchfab platform that is something like the YouTube uh, for 3D models has really helped in this. Um, they, I mean, it's easy to create your account and just to make um, available these 3D models of artifacts. And very soon, uh, uh, the date has not been confirmed, but will probably be uh, Monday the 12th of November, we will have a 3D imaging sprint of that collection uh, in the ICS that Gabby mentioned. We will ask students and members of the public to use photogrammetry to image the artifacts and then, and then make them available on a Sketchfab or, other, or any other platform uh, for anyone to, uh, to see and download and, uh, and reuse. And if you are listening to this uh, seminar because uh, as part of your uh, MA module in uh, Indigenous Culture Heritage or Ancient Art History or the Art of Making, uh, you are all invited to take part in this sprint. So practice your photogrammetry uh, because we're gonna we're gonna do a, a great job. Okay, um, there are uh, there are any other. Uh, questions or remarks or comments? Um. I was just going to come back to um, again to Anisa's question about whether museums make their three um, D three D images available. Um, I think, as as you say, more and more museums are, but um, some museums will be. Um, will be quite cautious about that at the moment. They'll, they'll, I mean, as with, as with putting images um, up on, on, in open access, um, some museums and, um, and galleries and so forth are concerned about the, the impact this might have on visitor numbers. Um, and it's, it's something they, they, they need to be concerned about. Um, but, um, but I think there are more and more of these things are made available. Ideally, um, people should be encouraged when they make things available. If you upload anything to Sketchfab, um, there's there's a little box you can tick, which is you know allow allow people to download this. Please do allow people to download this because it's really great for other people to be able to take and print these things, um, whether they're things you've made yourself, whether they're things you've scanned in museums, um, or whatever. Um, and uh, and yes, by all means, any object that you can get access to to take as many photographs as you would actually need to do photogrammetry, which is not which is not every object, and it's certainly it's hard to do through gra through glass and so forth. But if you can get access to objects to do to do that, then by all means, do um, take you know take teams of students out, tell them all to take you know hundreds of photographs each, um, collect them all together, and see what you can. Um, what you can reconstruct out of them. I think that would be that would be really, really important. It would also make a really good point that one of the the values of 3D models and in particular of printable 3D models is for people who live too far away from the British Museum to just go around there and pick up and handle an object. Because you know someone someone teaching archaeology in London might well say, why do I need this 3D print ever? I can take my students to the British Museum and we can handle a lekythos. Um, that may not be true if you're in Sao Paulo, right? Um, it's certainly not, you can't go to the British Museum. There may be more local museums that, that, that have them, but it's, it's gonna be, you know, access will be a lot harder. I mean, even if, you, even if you're just in, you know, another part, a rural part of the UK, um, you can't necessarily just, just pop down to London um, to, to, to visit the big museum or to Oxford or Cambridge or wherever and, 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 handle, and handle these objects. Um, if, you're, if, you know, if you're teaching in a, a, a less well-funded university or in, in, a, in a high school, um, you may not have access to, um, to all this. And so I think it really does make the point um, if people if people are doing doing this to be able to say why we're doing this and what we what we benefit from doing this, I think that's I think that's really really valuable, um, and I think it would it would it would add to this dialogue that we're having. Yeah, sure. And um, one very last thing, and I'm sure that we will get back to that when we will talk about um, copyright uh, and open access and what is the approach that you know museums are having and are planning to have uh, with digital cultural. Uh, heritage and 
you know, bottom-up reproductions of uh, digital artifacts. Um, I, I agree with you that there are still a lot of museums that are a little bit um, cautious and not, you know, uh, suspicious, let's say, of um, 3D technologies and 3D printing because they think that um, they will substitute somehow the visit and uh, I will, you know, state again that um, it, I mean, it is hard to me to, it is hard for me to believe that someone will ever see the digital uh, replicas as, you know, standing in the place of the original object. I don't think that is ever going to happen. I mean, people that have the choice to, you know, uh, go to the to, and to see the the actual artifact will always do that when they can at the right moment and everything the the 3d images the replicas are you know are something else are something that help us studying the original are something that help us you know manipulating uh, the original that we cannot actually touch that can you know enhance our discourse and our understanding um, on and of uh, the the original so i really hope that you know museums will uh, actually join in more and more as some are doing and um, and see digital actually as a promotion uh, and not a competition to the um, to the historical artifacts yeah I think even more um, even more of a of a concern maybe and maybe maybe slightly more you know um, sticky concern and 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 whatever, even for museums that don't charge entry, for example, is the idea that they might somehow be able to monetize this. They might somehow be able to sell 3D models of their objects, and therefore, by making the 3D um, the 3D models available to download for free, that people can produce their own um, prints of. Um, it may not reduce the number of people who visit, but it may reduce the number that they're able to sell in this right. imaginary future when they found a way to monetize this. Um, and I think I think a lot of the time, because museums do have to have to worry about their um, their their financial survival in their future, there is a lot of concern um, that you know that the 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 accountants in the institution do have quite a lot of power over decision making, and they will quite often veto something, even if there is absolutely zero um, currently imagined pathway to monetizing this, but. You know you why throw why throw that away as a possibility because that's how accountants think, um, and that's and that's fair enough because that's how they should think. But um, but there is there is of course you know we should we should be having a conversation about you know who would be making that decision um, and on what grounds and you know museums museums have to continue to exist. Part of their part of their brief is to make sure they don't go bust and and and, and disappear. But part of their brief is also to educate to entertain to um to support research um and and to engage and so forth and so all you know that can't be um you know it's it also i mean to, to to take this on a sort of larger political um question for for a moment you know we should also make sure as as a, as a society that museums aren't in danger of going under financially that they don't have to think about how am i going to monetize a chocolate lekythos um in order to in order to not go bust you know that that, that should just never be on the cards uh, the, the, the idea of the British Museum going bust, right? Um, anyway. Yeah, that, that, absolutely. Um, I think we are, uh, we have overrun uh, a little bit. Uh, um, I hope this was, it was a good conversation and um, uh, we will definitely talk more about uh, some of these issues when we will talk about uh, 3D modeling and again when we will be talking about um, open access with, with you again, Gav. Uh, so yes, um, thank you for uh, for following uh, this seminar. You'll find all the information about uh, the exercise and how to <clears throat> request a trial version of Agisoft in the in the in the seminar page. So yeah, thank you everyone. See you next week. Thanks. Bye. Bye.